So far in this class, we've talked about two different pillars of inference, significance and generalizability. In chapter three, we move on to estimation, which is asking how large is the effect? So let's think about the kinds of conclusions we've come to so far. We have strong evidence that the long run probability buzz pushes the correct button is larger than 0.5. But let's say we wanna estimate his accuracy rate. Um, we're gonna need some new techniques that we haven't seen yet. Or we have strong evidence that winning the overtime coin flip is an advantage. Okay, how big is that advantage, right? A p-value doesn't tell us if it's a big advantage or a small advantage, just that the evidence is strong. Or we have strong evidence that the average normal body temperature is different from 98.6, which shockingly is true. Um, then what is it? What is the average normal body temperature? Uh, we need a way to estimate that. So our goal in this chapter is to get interval estimates of a population parameter. In other words, we want a range of values that are reasonable for the population proportion or population mean. And this range of plausible values is called a confidence interval. We'll calculate confidence intervals in several different ways, some using simulations and some using theory. A September 2019 Pew Research poll asked, do you think it's the responsibility of the federal government to make sure all Americans have health care coverage, or is that not the responsibility of the federal government? So we had a sample of 2,004 Americans, and 59% of them answered yes. Um, there's a link to this poll in your notes, so if you want to see more detail about it, you can. So what's the target population here? Um, we want to say something about the opinions of all American adults. Right, that's the whole group that we're interested in. And then the variable is that opinion. So either they say, yes, it is the government's responsibility, or no, it is not. Um, so this is a categorical variable, and specifically we're treating it as binary. Um, there were a few people who didn't answer the question, didn't say yes or no, um, but we're not going to include them in our data set here. And then pi is the parameter. It's a numerical value that describes our population. So here it's the proportion, since we have categorical data, of all Americans, since that's our population. And we could define it in terms of those who say yes or no. Um, to me, it's a little bit more natural to define it in terms of those who say yes. And again, this is in the population. So the proportion of all Americans who say yes in the population. And that 59%, that's not our parameter. That's our sample value, right? We don't know how many people would actually say yes in the whole population, but we do know how many people said yes in the sample, and we're gonna use that to estimate the parameter. So let's start off with the kind of question like we would have answered in chapter one. Do we have strong evidence that the percentage who believe the federal government is responsible for providing healthcare coverage is different from 50% in the population? So our null hypothesis is that it actually is 50-50, and the alternative is that it is different from 50-50. So let's go to the one proportion applet, and it automatically does 50-50. Um, our number of tosses is gonna be very large because this is a big sample, 2004. So we can draw our samples. This time it was 1,008 heads. Um, I'm gonna change that to a proportion, so pretty close there to 0.5. And obviously these are going to be all a little bit different. So we're saying if it were really 50-50, what sample values would we expect to get? Okay, so let's do a whole bunch. And our graph looks something like this. So if it were really 50-50, how likely would we be to get our sample data? So our value was 0.59. So really far away from our null distribution here. Um, this would be two-sided, but even so, um, our estimate for the p-value is zero. So for now, let's use an alpha level of 0.05, but it doesn't really matter what we choose here. Um, we have very strong evidence that it's not actually 0.5 in the population. So our p-value being approximately zero means this would be very unlikely to occur um, if the null hypothesis was actually true. So we have very strong evidence that the parameter, the population proportion who hold this opinion, is not equal to 0.5. In other words, this is not a plausible value for our parameter. So if we're going to make a range of plausible values, 0.5 should not be included. So our p-value here is approximately zero, 
And is that a plausible value for the parameter? No, right? We have strong evidence that pi is not equal to 0.5. So what about all these other values? Let's start over here at um, 0.58. So again, I'm going to use an alpha level of 0.05. And for now, I'm going to test that pi is equal to 0.58. That's my null hypothesis. And my alternative is going to be that pi is different from 0.58. And now that we have the main idea down, why don't we switch over to the theory-based inference applet just so we'll all be getting the same p-values. So our sample size here is 2004, and our sample proportion is 0.59. So I'm going to do the test of significance here. So you can see when we tried 0.5, we got an extremely small p-value here. So why don't we try a value closer to our sample proportion, right? Our sample proportion was 59%, so surely 59% is a reasonable value for the population parameter. Um, but what about 0.58? Let's try that. So all I have to do is put in 0.58 and click Calculate again. And you can see 0.58 has a large p-value, 0.3731. So if the p-value is large, that means that we cannot reject that value, right? 0.58 is a reasonable value for the parameter, so we would say yes, this value is plausible. So 0.50 has a very small p-value, it is not plausible. 0.58 has a large p-value, it is plausible. So somewhere in between there, it crosses over. So I'm going to give you a chance to fill out the rest of this table, and I'll give you a hint that there's ways to fill it out without calculating every single one, um, but I'll sort of leave that up to you. But the basic thing that you're going to be doing for this is just changing these numbers in the test of significance, changing the null hypothesis values, and recalculating it. So go ahead and pause the video here and finish filling out this table. So on the low end, 0.58 and 0.57 both have large p-values, so those are plausible. Whereas 0.56, you've gotten too far away from the sample value, that's not plausible anymore. And you can see the trend, the p-values are just getting smaller and smaller. So if 0.56 is not a plausible value, 0.55 will not be either. And you can do the same sort of thing on the other side. Um, in fact, this should be more or less symmetrical. So since we had two plausible values on the low end, not surprising that we have two plausible values on the high end. And let's say we wanted to get more granular with it, we could. So like 0.57 is plausible, 0.56 is not. So let's try somewhere in between. That's not plausible. Not quite. 0.569, okay, so there our p-value crosses over the 0 0.05 mark, so 0 0.569 would be considered plausible. So I'm going to write that down as the low end of my confidence interval. And I'm going to expect basically the same thing to happen on the other side. So 0 0.611 is still considered a plausible value. The p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, but 0 0.612 is not. So the last plausible value that we've got here is 0.611. So that's going to be the top end of my confidence interval. So basically the idea is if your p-value is larger than alpha, you can't reject that value, so it's plausible and it belongs inside your confidence interval. So this interval of plausible values is called a 95% confidence interval. Um, the 95% is called the confidence level. And this is sort of the, the complement of our significance level. So if we set our significance level as 0 0.05, that corresponds to 95% confidence. So to interpret these, we always start off, we are 95% confident that, and then we're going to state whatever our parameter is. So in this case, our parameter was the true population proportion true population proportion who believe, I'm sort of writing out the whole thing, believe that government um, is responsible for healthcare coverage. So that's our parameter in context. We're 95% confident that our parameter in context is between these values. So in this case is between 0.569 and 0.611. 
So we started off with a sample proportion and we ended up with a range of reasonable values for the population proportion. You'll also hear people talk about the margin of error. The margin of error is just half the width of our confidence interval. So we can subtract the endpoints to get the width, 0.611 minus 0.569, and divide that in half, and we get 0 0.021. So another way to write our confidence interval is as the statistic, so the summary of the sample, plus or minus the margin of error. So in this case, our statistic was 0.59, and our margin of error was 0 0.021. And that's just another way of expressing the same interval, 0 0.569 up to 0 0.611. So in this video, we were using a statistic, a sample proportion, to find a range of reasonable values for the parameter, the population proportion. But it's important to keep in mind that this is only valid if our statistic is a good estimate in the first place. So remember, the margin of error only accounts for sampling variability, the fact that one random sample will produce a slightly different statistic from another. It is not a way to account for all of the sampling issues that we learned about in Chapter 2. So an issue particular to this situation, in Chapter 2 we learned that wording really matters when you talk about health care reform. Um, so for example, if you compare it to Medicare, government-administered health insurance might be um, pretty popular, whereas if you call it a government-run insurance plan, it may be much less popular. I was actually really annoyed when Vox ran this article a couple of years ago. Um, the headline was, An Astonishing Change in How Americans Think About Government-Run Healthcare. First of all, that's irritating to me because I'll decide what's astonishing. Um, I, you don't need to tell me that. Um, but also because they used the phrase government-run healthcare, which I knew was pretty unpopular. And if you look in the table, if you look at the survey they actually used, the question was, it's the responsibility of the federal government to ensure that all Americans have health coverage. Ensuring that all Americans have health coverage might sound very different to the people answering the survey than government-run health care. So it's really important to make sure that um, the headline matches the question that was actually asked. For looking at changes over time, the best approach is to look at somebody like Gallup or Pew, who's been using sort of the same methodology, asking the same question year after year. That would be the best way to see um, actual trends. So even though we're using math to account for sampling variability and account for the margin of error, that doesn't mean that those design issues aren't important. They're still just as important as they were before.